Good evening, everyone. My name is Alec Kerr. I'm the former chair of the Board of Trustees of the Free Library, and I currently am a member of the Board of Directors of the Free Library Foundation. It is my true pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight for a very special evening. First, as always, some administrative announcements. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones. And I'd also like to remind you that there is no flash photography permitted during tonight's event. Following the lecture, a book signing will take place upstairs in the lobby. And obviously, don't forget that most of our author events, including tonight's, are offered as podcasts at freelibrary.org. It's also important to remember that we're able to enjoy this evening together because of the generosity of the Horace W. Goldsmith Foundation, which has endowed this lecture. The chair of the foundation is Bill Slaughter, a distinguished litigator with Ballard Spar, and we're so appreciative of the foundation's support in making tonight's event possible. Also, we never miss the opportunity to make a pitch. From our wonderful author event series to our innovative new culinary lectures and literary center, to our preschool reading programs, to our 53 branches in every neighborhood in Philadelphia. The Free Library is dedicated to providing people of all ages with excellent programming and transformational resources. We change lives. And many of our most beloved programs and services are made possible only with the help of private support for people like you. I ask you to please consider making a gift in whatever amount you are able, if you haven't already done so, to support the important work of the Free Library. You can learn more about the opportunities for making a gift at freelibrary.org slash support. Now, obviously, to the main event. It's been said that no one can lay claim to so much influence on the shaping of foreign policy over the past 50 years as Secretary Henry Kissinger. A vital presence in international and national politics since the 1950s, and named one of the foreign policy magazine's top 100 global thinkers, Dr. Kissinger served as the 56th Secretary of State under Presidents Nixon and Ford and as the National Security Advisor for six years. During that time, he pioneered the policy of detente with the Soviet Union, orchestrated the opening of relations with China, and successfully negotiated the Paris Peace Accord which accomplished the withdrawal of American forces from Vietnam, for which he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973, and parenthetically, the gratitude of this young lieutenant in the United States Army. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. His countless other honors include the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Medal of Liberty, and the National Book Award for History for the first volume of his memoirs, the White House years. His new book, World Order, is a shrewd and comprehensive analysis of the challenges of building international order in a world of differing perspectives, violent conflict, burgeoning technology, and ideological extremism. In it, you'll learn about the Westphalian peace and be led on a fascinating exploration of European balance of power from Charlemagne to the present time, Islam in the Middle East, the US and Iran, the multiplicity of Asia, and the continuing development of US policy. In my business, the questions are often more important than the answers, and Secretary Kissinger has some brilliant ones, such as, what do we seek to prevent, no matter how it happens, and even if we have to do it alone? What do we seek to achieve, even if not supported by anyone? 
What should we not engage in, even if urged by a multilateral group? And most importantly, what is the nature of the values we seek to advance? You will be intrigued and challenged by this book. I can't finish without mentioning probably one of Secretary Kissinger's least known, but as a transplanted native New Yorker, I think most wonderful honors. In 1976, he was made the first honorary member of the Harlem Globetrotters. <laughs> <clears throat> Mr. Kissinger will be Dr. Kissinger will be interviewed this evening by Jeff Greenfield, an acclaimed television commentator and author in his own right, who lectured here last year about his book, If Kennedy Lived. It's an honor and a privilege to have both of them here with us, and I'm only sorry I wasn't able to arrange the playing of Sweet Georgia Brown. <laughs> but please join me in welcoming Henry, he Henry Kissinger and Jeff Greenfield to the Free Library of Philadelphia. When uh, Henry Kissinger was named Secretary of State, the press asked him, what shall we call you? Professor Kissinger, Dr. Kissinger, Secretary Kissinger. He replied, no, Your Excellency will do. <laughs> this is not my plan for tonight. Um, this book, World Order, covers roughly 400 years of diplomatic, geopolitical, and military history and in four or five continents. We have a little less than an hour. Um, when we finish dealing with the whole book, we'll talk about tax policy. <laughs> but what I want to do is to take, Dr. Kissinger, what you have written and see its application today. I think anybody looking at the headlines would look at your book and say, what world order? Um, the Westphalian peace that you talk about where states respect each other's territorial integrity, balance each other out, don't interfere. You look at ISIL, which crosses national boundaries. You look at the United States bombing in Syria to stop ISIL, to, which helps protect the Syrian dictator we want out. Um, you have Afghanistan, which you describe really less as a country than a group of tribes whose central mode of power is resentment and vengeance. Can you look at the world today and actually say, yeah, I, something like a world order is either possible or still extant, or is that an old concept that is simply not applicable today? Well, uh, first of all, I agree with you that there is no world order today. And uh, perhaps if I tell you what induced me to write the book. I was having dinner with a friend, professor at Yale, and I was discussing various ideas I had for writing a book, uh, most of which had to do with historical episodes or personalities. And he said, you've written a lot of history why don't you write something about what concerns you most at the moment? And what concerns me most at the moment is the absence of world order. The fact that for the first time in history, different regions of the world are interacting with each other. In the classical period, the Roman Empire and the Chinese Empire existed without any significant knowledge and acted without any reference to what the other were doing. So the reality of the present period is that different societies with different histories 
are now part of a global system because but that they don't have an agreed concept of world order. So uh, I began with the Westphalian piece for two reasons. Because uh, that is the only formal system of world order that has been devised. And because it was the dominant system in Europe, and because the Europeans, as part of the imperialism, brought it around the world as a concept. But there was a unique aspect to the European experience. In most, in every other part of the world, whatever order existed was part of an empire. In China, the idea that states balance each other didn't exist. And in the Islamic world, it didn't exist in, uh, in, 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 in that sense. Europe is the only society where the, where the sovereignty of states and the balance of their actions with each other was believed to produce international order and international law. So that's why it started with that and then attempted to apply it to many uh, contemporary circumstances. But this is not a cookbook you can read to say what the international order will be. It is an attempt to tell you this is what we are up against now. This is the challenge we have. And here are some ways of looking at it. But it does not say that I know what the end result of all these conflicts and these ambiguities, some of which you described, will be. What I'm getting at is this, the Westphalian peace, which is 1680, 1648, after a 30 years war. There's a, by the way, those of you who like to believe that history repeats itself, you remember the fight over the shape of the Paris Peace Court table? 1648. The sensibilities of the various diplomats were such that they had to build an endless number of doors so that everybody could enter by the same important door. And I believe you described they had to walk could the same enter pace. at the same moment. Yeah. Walk to, so it was like, so some, some things don't change. But I think the more, rele, the more relevant part, though, is, is it folly to look at a 360-year-old uh, set of conferences involving one small part of the globe and think that it somehow has applicability to what we need in the 21st century where you have an Islamist power that believes it is destined to rule the world. You may not have a Chinese empire, but you have a China that, that is reaching across the globe for resources. You have an international banking system that knows no national borders. The question is, in this age, the question for me is, is that even a model worth thinking about as, as relevant? Now, what the, the reason uh, uh, I started with the Westphalian system is this. Uh, Europe had undergone a 30 years war very similar to what is now going on in the Middle East, of every faction fighting every other, and some of them using the religious convictions for geopolitical purposes. And at the end of this period, which, uh, in which maybe a third of the population of Central Europe were killed with conventional weapons. So that's a uh, massive effort. Uh, the then leaders got together and on a number of principles, which was that the basic unit of international relations should be the state. That the state, that countries should not intervene in the domestic affairs of other states. And that uh, the 
borders of that that international affairs began by attempting to have an impact on on other societies and that some kind of international law should be created and that diplomats should be should be called into existence as permanent ambassadors in each other's countries that had never happened before and so the interesting thing is none of these people were overwhelming statesmen uh, but out of a suffering they distilled a number of principles which then for several hundred years governed European relations and were brought by the Europeans and by us around the world. Now some of them are still of great consequence, namely that the basic unit of international relations should be the state and that if you conduct foreign policy on a purely ideological basis and try to undermine the existence of the state that then the structure of restraint that could be created uh, disappears. Now, of course, we are at end, so non-intervention, settled principles of conduct, these were useful instruments. The dilemma of the present period is that uh, Several things are happening simultaneously. The state as a political organization is attacked in many parts of the world and non-state actors are appearing that have power that used to be associated with the state. Secondly, the economic organization of the world and the political organization of the world are not comparable anymore. The political organization is based on the nation. The economic organization of the world attempts to achieve globalization, which means it transcends uh, uh, borders. So there are very many profound challenges today. Uh, so what I'm attempting to do in the book is to say here is where this idea of order started. Sooner or later we will come to some concept of order because without it there will be no principles to govern conduct and there will be no restraint on the exercise of power. Now how we get there uh, that is the big challenge because for us in America we have believed that our principles are the universal principles that everybody must accept uh, and I as an individual believe that they are universal principles but how to relate this to other societies who have comparable views that is one of the great challenges we face. But as you point out in your book there are some forces that reject fundamentally the premise you just outlined. Uh, the one that you point to with most alarm uh, is Islamism and particularly as the Iranian uh, folks in charge uh, practice that. You, if I read your book correctly, the people who really run around, the, the theocrats, how many, believe that Islam is destined to rule the world that it is the only legitimate way. So the idea of saying to Iran, if I read your book right, well, you won't interfere here, we won't intervene there, that's at a basic level, that's un-Islamic. I mean, doesn't that pose a rather difficult challenge? That is the big internal debate that is now going on inside Iran. And the point I'm making, uh, uh, it's, it's Iran at this moment 
had three historic models before it in its own history. The experience of being a nation state uh, pursuing normal or traditional nation state uh, actions, which is more or less what they did under the Shah and for a hundred years uh, before that. Second model they have in their history is that of an empire, because for a great part of its, of its history, Iran was a great empire extending from the borders of what is today India and even into India, uh, well into what today we, uh, covering most of what we today call the Middle East and extending to the edge of, Af of Africa. And third, it's the experience of Khomeini, which you have correctly described, which, and which is the view of the present theocracy, which is that uh, uh, the Islamic faith, it's the governing guide, should be the governing guide of Iranian policy, and that therefore the United States is a permanent enemy. And the view I express here and is that Iran has to make a choice. I mean, it doesn't have to announce a choice, but it has to make a perceptible choice which of these three models it is following. Uh, if it, and, and one has to remember one other thing about Iran, of all the countries that were conquered by Islam, Iran is the only one that did in the Middle East, anyway, the only one that did not give up its language, nor its culture, and that it maintained the Iranian culture and language, it did not adapt, uh, adapt Arabic. So there is always a distinct feeling of something special uh, about Iran. So at the end of November, we are going to be confronting, we as a country, the end of the culmination of the negotiations about the nuclear weapons. And uh, they will have to be judged by one's assessment about what the uh, ultimate purpose of the uh, Iranian governing group is. So here's an argument I have heard about the optimistic way to look at Iran. Now, Fareed Zakaria has made this point, that over time, leaders in countries that once seemed really ominously threatening change. You mentioned in your book a forgotten part of history. The 1957 Mao Zedong goes to Moscow, and he makes a speech, I guess, in which he says, you know, this fear about nuclear war, we can lose several hundred million people. We're a big country, and if we wind up with a communist world, so be it. I gather the Soviet Union was unimpressed by this argument. Terrified. So then they were, it, they took notice of this. So then 14 years later, uh, you're in Beijing and things change. And the question is when you hear the Iranians talk as they do, is it useful to point to an example like the evolution of China, the fact that longtime enemies now are at peace with each other, that even in Northern Ireland, 800 years of violence has at least been eased. Should we take those examples and say, all right, let's see what happens in Iran. Maybe they will evolve out of their, out of their current theories and come to a more Westphalian view of the world. Well, you know, uh, Westphalian, Westphalian section was only to describe how an international okay. system came into being. Uh, no serious person thinks that you can apply exactly the same uh, principles. What you can apply is to ask the question, what are the basic units that 
are in touch with each other and by what methods it should they be in touch with each other and how do they communicate with each other and what is it they should try to achieve uh, together. Now, it's of course possible that this evolution uh, occurs. And, but it is not possible that as an American leader, you'd say, because everything evolves. Uh, why don't we just sit back and let it evolve <laughs> and we'll see what happens. Uh, with respect to some issues that it's maybe permissible. Uh, in the case of China, the transformation of the conduct of China, which started out by Mao as to be built as a model of revolution for the uh, rest uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, this, con continu this pattern continued until there was a conflict, the, the ideological, con the uh, practical and ideological con conflict with the Soviet Union caused the Soviet Union to move 42 divisions to the Chinese border. And then Mao looked at this as a practical problem of statecraft. How do, you, do I protect my state against this? And the United States was the only uh, available partner. It may, be, may interest you if this is, I don't know whether I put this in the book or not. Uh, the persistence of traditional ways of thinking, uh, it's shown by this episode, Nixon and to some extent, I, from the first day in office, had concluded that an attempt must be made to bring China into the international system. As I recall, he wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs before he was ever elected that hinted at that. I beg your pardon? Nixon wrote a piece in Foreign Affairs Yet magazine in 67, yeah, called Asia After Vietnam, and there was a hint in the midst of the normal rhetoric Absolutely. that this was on his mind. And... Uh, China was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, so it was very hard to know at what do or do not, even to get a, to get a, uh, uh, to, to get a dialogue started. But uh, the, what the incident I wanted to mention, it's, it's the CIA wrote periodic reports about what China might do. And they published a report, and this is now available. They published a report in early July 1971 while I was on my way to China, which they didn't know, uh, which said, uh, which said, uh, which listed all the arguments I've just made of why China should look to the United States but they concluded with saying, this cannot happen while Mao is alive. So one has to wait till, till Mao is dead. Today we know that it could not have happened so fast he unless he was alive. Well, uh, that's reassuring that the CIA hasn't changed all that much. Uh. <laughs> well, it was understandable because uh, at any rate, uh, uh, then China and the United States had to deal with each other as great powers. And if you read, and the, they're all available now, the early conversations, say, on my trip to China, uh, Joe and I and I were talking like two college professors discussing abstract concepts of international relations. We didn't go through any of the technical issues or tactical issues that divided us. Why? 
because both of us decided independently that at this point the most important quality to be achieved was can we understand what the other side is doing? So as we go into this world of three countries, China, Russia, and the United States, maneuvering against each other or co cooperating with each other. So we were building a kind of international system. Uh, and, and I would say it was about three years before we really got to grips with the day-to-day -day issue. You know, there's so many areas to cover in, in so little time, but you raise one of the areas that I wanted to say that the critical, the critical step was to understand what the other person was, how the other person was thinking. It's a point that was made, I know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The, the points that are given to John Kennedy were that against the impulses of some of his advisors, he kept trying to put himself in Khrushchev's shoes. So the question that this raises is, it seems to me that some of the United States' biggest missteps, I'll use a polite word, in foreign policy, have come from precisely the fact that we haven't understood the terrain or the people in which we were trying to act. Um, I mean, most recently, I mean, I'm not trying to be partisan because I can think of both parties, but certainly it seems to me that the decision to go into Iraq which from your point of view, you, you say nice things about Bush. I mean, you did serve Republican presidents, but it seems pretty clear to me that, that you regard that kind of notion that we would go into Iraq, build a democracy, it would spread through the Middle East like a virtuous circle as kind of really naive, if not worse. Well, I, uh, uh, if it were about Bush, uh, it, it, it did me the honor of inviting me to discuss long-range international affairs with him without any publicity at fairly regular intervals uh, in his second term. And so I developed a, a personal affection for him and I was, and, and I was impressed by his concerns. Uh, and uh, uh, there was some criticism that I recorded my personal view of Bush, which I normally did not do in the other chapters. Uh, well, anyway, now uh, about the decision to go into Iraq. From a security point of view, after the United States had been attacked from, by terrorists based in the Middle East, it was quite rational for the President of the United States to focus on a country that he genuinely believed was building nuclear weapons. It was turned out to be wrong, but uh, it is also wrong to say that this was fake they genuinely believed this, that had violated a ceasefire agreement with us on many occasions certified by the United Nations, and which might be a base, uh, which might encourage uh, uh, a, uh, terrorist activities in the region. And one has it is also worthwhile to remember that in the Clinton administration in 1998, the Senate voted in a non-binding resolution, 98 or nothing, that Saddam should be removed and that Clinton signed this. So this was not a novel idea that Bush introduced. And uh, I supported that part of it where I disagreed with, uh, with Bush was in the belief, was in the belief that after Saddam had been overthrown, that we had the capacity to 
make a democracy out of a country during military occupation that not only was Islamic and therefore of a different uh, approach to the notion of pluralism, uh, but also in which the uh, there was a profound division between the Shia and the Sunni part, and a profound division between the Kurds and the Sunnis and the Shia. So I think that that is where uh, where it went wrong. And With respect, I mean, I, it's, it does seem to me that the, the and evidence. And I explain is, why I think that. Well, yeah. it, it does seem to me that the, what the history has shown is that. That, yes, there was a lot of rhetorical notion that Saddam has to come out. When the decision was made, it seemed to me that the history shows that the people within that administration were determined to go to Iraq, helped shape the evidence to it. The notion that they were involved with 9-11 was, was never close to being accurate. And to take your point, that they, that they were, I mean, your point that, that is throughout this book is they were, they were at best the victims of delusions about what they could do. But uh, we, we are so pressed for time that there are about 25 other things I'd like to talk to you about. No, but the but point is not that, that the U.S. government or the president cannot misunderstand the situation. Uh, the point uh, is what the larger purposes of the United States in the construction of the region should yes. be. And there are some things we are able to do, and the other things we cannot do. This is why, before I ask your last question, I have to make this observation. It's nowhere in your book. George, Bush, George W. Bush's second inaugural address proclaimed that it will be the policy of the United States to spread freedom and end tyranny everywhere in the world. And I actually thought of you when I heard that, because I thought if you were watching that at home, you were throwing something at the television set. <laughs> because it so exemplifies what you think is a dangerous misapprehension of how the world works. No. Uh, the United States has to have three levels, of, in my, three levels of understanding of the world. One, objectives or definitions of security that are so vital to us that we will defend them or try to achieve them, even alone, if necessary. The second is objectives and security concerns, which are important to us, but which we will try to achieve only with allies. And the third is objectives and security concerns which we sh should not do, because they're beyond our either capabilities or value framework. Mm -hmm. So this is the sort of discussion we need to have. Your turn. Um, we have, when you, if, if you have a question, raise your hand, we will get a mic to you, and please, as I said a year ago, I'm sure you all remember, we have to come to a common understanding of what a question is. <laughs> this is very important, and I will be exceedingly undiplomatic, like Dr. Kissinger, in making sure that we have questions. So, mics to the people with hands raised. Oh, I get to call, I'm sorry. Let's start in the front row, because I can see that. I'll get back to you, I promise. Thank you both for an enlightening evening. Uh, Dr. Kissinger, uh, if you were National Security Advisor, what would you advise Br uh, uh, President Obama to do with regard to sending troops to the Middle East? Yeah. You know, uh, it's very hard to give tactical advice. Let me tackle the question. In, in another way. Uh, I've now uh, lived so long 
that I have witnessed and in a way participated in five wars. Some as an active participant, some as an observer who knew the key players. And if you look at the five wars that the United States conducted since 1945, we have achieved our stated objective in only one, uh, which is the first Gulf War. The Korean War was sort of a draw, and the other three wars we withdrew from. But each of them started, like this one now is, with great enthusiasm, great public support, and then at some point, the only key debate was, how do you get out of it? And withdrawal became the only strategy accepted as a general consensus. So what I would say to, to the president as security advisor and what I say to him, would say to you is, tell me how it's going to end. And tell me how, let's get a plan. I think it was correct that when, when Americans are murdered on television for the purpose of intimidating uh, regions and ourselves, uh, I think it is right for us to respond. But we also need a strategy of how it will end and what we're trying to achieve. And I would tell him that this internally, not with great public speeches yet, should be the most important thing that he can do. Halfway back, yes. Could you stand up? Sure. You'll project better. Back in the 60s, the U.S. Uh, supported the removal of some of the Latin American governments and the establishment of non-democratic governments in the region and in some countries, dictatorships that we would consider barbarian by all means nowadays. When you look back today, do you think it was the right policy for the U.S. to support the establishment of those non-democratic governments? I can't answer the question in the abstract until I know what government you're talking about and whether what you consider the American establishing of them, whether that's a correct description of it. Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay. Uh, you see, the trouble with this sort of debate is uh, that when, when these ideas were first debated or when these charges were first made. Uh, partly as a result of the Vietnam War, it had become axiomatic that the United States was conducting immoral foreign policies and therefore one need not consider what serious people conducting serious policies might, uh, might do. Uh, the Chile thing Many books have been written on this, and there's no possible way we can come to a, uh, a conclusion uh, uh, about it. Uh, when the, but there is one incontrovertible, incontrovertible fact, is that when the revolution that over, overthrew Allende occurred, uh, Every Democratic Party in Chile supported it. And every 
Democratic Party uh, uh, welcomed it. Then when Pinochet, whom we did not put in, uh, up to it because we didn't even know him, uh, when Pinochet established a uh, uh, autocratic regime, that's when the Democratic parties in uh, in Chile uh, uh, turned ship. And then the practical problem for any American president faced with this situation is uh, can you get involved in trying to overthrow any government uh, which does not follow American preferences? And what are the consequences for the United States? Well, it's not as though we hadn't done that in the past. Yeah, that, hmm? I mean, we, you know, in Iran, in Guatemala, we tried to overthrow Castro. It's, it's not as though the United States said, have whatever system you want, when it got to be tricky for the seizing of American companies. It seemed to me that America was well, perfectly but, uh, happy to try. I, I don't know about the Guatemala because uh, that okay. was... Uh, uh, that that was before my time. Uh, okay, no, Doctor, it was before my time look, too. Just it's to, very know. easy. It's very easy to sit in judgment after the event. Uh, if you start from the assumption that people in high office uh, generally are there because they think there's no, nothing more important they can do with their lives except to improve the security and the values of, of our country. They can then still come to wrong conclusions. But this idea that the United States likes, uh, it, it faces a practical problem. Uh, let me give you an experience I know about. Uh, in 1973, Egypt was showing signs of wanting to move out of the Soviet orbit into relationship with the United States. And fr from the point of view of stability in the Middle East, and peace in the region, we strongly encouraged it. Of course we knew that Sadat was also a basically autocratic ruler, but I thought of him, I grew to think of him as a great man who contributed tremendously to the peace process in the region. And I wish we had another Sadat with whom one could deal as one dealt with him. And then he was succeeded by Mubarak. I, I was not in office at that time, so I, this is not a defense of any particular position. But in any one year, the American president and security advisor and secretary of state have a finite number of problems that it is possible to deal with. And to stir up the Middle East when you don't know what the outcome will be, and when the outcome may be not at all uh, democratic, as happened after Tahrir Square, which we did support. This is a question one should reflect upon. That doesn't say that oh, every decision was correct, but one cannot simultaneously say the United States should not be involved everywhere and say, however, they should overthrow the democratic, uh, anti-democratic governments. I understand what you are saying. Uh, it's, I'm not saying that America has always acted consistently. I've laid out what I think the okay. basic principles should be, uh, but I've seen enough of it to know that that the, in the operation of, uh, about the security and survival of the United States, 
one has to make some allowance for the contingent and for circumstance. Someone on this side? Yes, uh, sir. I do regret that, you know, this is after 30 years in television, you know. I think the thought we'd come here, we have all this time. But we're down to our last question or two, sir. Uh, the, Dr. Kissinger, the separation of church and state is the fundamental principle of Western democracies, and one can argue really fueled their rise and their success. Yet in most troubled regions of the world, uh, it seems to be a heresy punishable by death uh, in some cases. Do you think that this is a fundamental gap or fundamental problem uh, that is a long-term barrier to, to true global world order? Well, it is, if it's, if a, first of all, I agree with you as a correct definition of American fundamental principles. In the Islam, in the Islamic religion, it is not possible to separate church and state because uh, uh, they are cons considered to be part of the same uh, overriding philosophy. And you see, even in Turkey, in which they attempted to create a secular state, it is now drifting back towards the uh, Islamic uh, concept. It isn't so much the case in relations with China because China has no concept, no national concept of religion. Uh, uh, it also has no, uh, no national concept of pluralism. But it's a different issue with, in China than it is in, uh, with respect to the Muslim world or to any order in which religion and the state are merged. Let me see if we can get somebody all the way back. In the very last row. Yes. That Thank seat would have cost you $500 or Derek Jeter's last game, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this will be very short, but uh, I wanted to thank uh, His Excellency for all of the, uh, all of the wonderful uh, things that he's had to say over his career on the importance of statesmanship. And, and uh, statesmanship uh, wasn't really mentioned uh, tonight. And I wonder and ask the question that uh, where can, can we learn how to be better statesmen? Where is statesmanship being taught uh, any place uh, in our country that you could signal out as, as fulfilling that role that, that was developed in your own mind and in your writing uh, uh, over the years, and particularly reflected in this book? Uh. I think that is a, a very uh, important question because statesmanship consists of helping to lead your society from where it is to where it hasn't been. So it needs a combination of courage and character and above all an sense for the trends of the period. And uh, if you look at the great statesmen, they have generally had the quality, this quality. Now in our society, it's extremely pragmatic and considers problem solving rather than reflection about historical evolution as its principal uh, uh, objective. And secondly, there are two, two other uh, obstacles, or two other problems we face. Our electoral process is getting so complicated and so expensive that the leaders have to spend so much of their time on the process 
and on raising money and on answering questions on television shows, that it's not, there isn't enough time to reflect about the direction of the future. If you look at prison in the 19th century, they had a succession of prime ministers, Palmerston, Disraeli, Gladstone, Salisbury, uh, for almost a century, all of whom, whatever differences they had, had some basic convictions about the role of Britain, the actions Britain should take. Uh, and the reason for it was that they came from, they lived in an environment in which these values were sort of taken for granted and therefore provided a basis for, uh, uh, for creative uh, thinking. Uh, I'm very worried, and I expressed that in this book, about the impact of what? The, the way history is taught and conceived on the ability to develop these qualities. You know what occurred to me? If you'd, go, if you'd tried to go to Pakistan and through to China with today's technology, somebody would have taken an iPhone picture of you and tweeted it out, and the whole secret would have been blown before you ever got to Beijing. And I'm sure, you know, I mean, think about that. It, 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 it's, a different, it's a different world. We have time for a couple more questions? No? We're done? Okay. Look, I'm, I, I'm sorry, folks, <laughs> but can we thank Dr. Kissinger? <laughs>